welcome to the Project Management Prepcast, helping you prepare for the PMP exam. Here's your instructor, Cornelius Fichtner. Hello and welcome to the Project Management Prepcast, where you study for the PMP exam in the comfort of your sofa. I'm your instructor, Cornelius Fichtner. The PMP exam is an experience-based exam. Some questions, yep, they are knowledge-based, but most of them, they will be situational and you have to apply your experience to the questions while remaining within the PMBOK guide framework. In this lesson, we look at how to apply the concept of virtual team management from the PMBOK guide into the real world. You will probably have noticed that Communications technology seems to make the world smaller and smaller and smaller, and that all our project teams are suddenly all over the planet. Your sponsor is in Germany, your customer is in Chile, your engineer is in Togo, two designers are in Sydney, and you yourself, well, you're leading this team while sitting with your laptop on the beaches of Tahiti. Ah, What a great life we project managers have, don't we? But unfortunately, these virtual teams are also quite demanding. You must deal with a multitude of cultures, several time zones, and the fact that your team doesn't have a chance to meet face to face. And that is not an easy task. Adrian Keane can help. Adrian is a PMP and has experience in managing virtual teams at Cisco Systems. She also teaches a seminar on effective virtual management at the University of California, Irvine. And in this lesson, you will hear her best practices. This discussion shows you how to apply good communication skills in order to build a cohesive team, both important aspects in the PMBOK guide and on the PMP exam. Let's hear a little bit about our guest and then go straight into the interview. Adrian Keane, PMP, is a manager of employee and manager development. She has over 20 years of information technology, business operations and consulting experience in the finance, automotive and high-tech industries. Her experience includes leading major projects as well as functional management. She has extensive experience leading global virtual teams. Adrian has been active in PMI for the last 10 years, serving in several board positions, including president of the PMI Orange County Chapter. Okay, hello Adrian and welcome to the program. Thanks Cornelius. To get us going, I'd like to look at the basics of virtual teams. So tell me, what is a virtual team and why are they challenging to manage? Well, Cornelius, I've been working on virtual teams at Cisco Systems for approximately the last five years. And what's different is typically the teams are separated by distance or separated by geography. So you end up having to work across time zones, cultural differences. It's actually quite challenging. It brings a whole different level of for the project manager from a co-located team. You have to really rely heavily on technology to help you to share information. So for instance, when you're in a team meeting and you're trying to get a concept well understood, you want to use a technology like NetMeeting or something called eCollaborate where you can share your slides and share information. What would you say is the biggest mistakes then that we project managers make when we are trying to manage virtual teams? Is it not employing technology or what is it? I think it's really it really centers around communication. We tend to make assumptions because we can't see people when we're in a virtual team. All we can do is hear. We make assumptions of perhaps about what's going on within the room. So we might be discussing a particular issue. And as a project manager, I might take the silence in the room to mean, great, everybody's on board. When what's really happening is people are rolling their eyes, they're checking their email, they're watching television at their house, and they're not even paying any attention to me. So I always tell people, don't underestimate the amount of communication that you need to do as a project manager on a virtual team. I'd say my communication went from being 20 to 30% of my time to being 70 to 80% of my time as a project manager. I I assume you hate mute buttons, right? 
<laughs> I love the mute button because <laughs> on your <laughs> end, right? <laughs> my end. But yeah, there's a lot of things, you know, etiquette when you're working with virtual teams that you have to talk to the team about when you get started about not, you know, being on mute is okay, but checking your email and doing other things when you're on a team meeting is really disrespectful to the other people on the call. But it's very tempting and easy to do. Yeah. I've, we've all done it. We've I, all done I it. Yeah, we're all guilty of this. I have done this many yeah. times, yes. Let me take you back to your very first project when you had to lead a virtual team. What was it like for you? What, what did you do? How did you do it? What would you do differently today? Well, that first project was um, at Cisco Systems, and I was asked to work on a global team, lead a global team to develop consistent delivery practices across our organization of about a thousand engineers. And I was working with people in all different time zones, all over the world, different cultures. And for the most part, I didn't know these people. So it was really challenging. Um, I really had to spend time uh, building trust, like getting to know people, spend a lot of one-on-one -on -one time getting to know them. We were fortunate enough to do one of, one of my best practices, which is have a co-located kickoff meeting. So bring the team to, we got to bring the team together face-to-face and got to do a lot of team building and, and get to know each other there. I think some of the things that um, I learned, as I said before, was about making assumptions. And, you know, on the virtual calls, I, I had to learn to listen, not to what only was being said, but to what wasn't being said, and who wasn't saying it. So if somebody was particularly silent on a call, I learned that I needed to follow up with that person after and really check in and make sure they were on board. You said your favorite tool is to have a co-located kickoff meeting to build trust among the team. Now, let's assume I don't have that because, frankly, if I, if I, I, I have a virtual team, but I have, don't have the money for it. What can I do as a project manager in that situation? What are other tools and tricks that allow you to build trust on, on the team? So I'll talk about trust from two perspectives. Building trust between myself as the project manager and my team members I'm going to schedule at least one-on-one, one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one meeting, solid one-on-one, -on -one, one-hour meeting where I'm going to talk to them and really get to know them and not just about work, but get to know about their families, their hobbies, what kinds of things they like to do outside of work. And then from a work perspective, I want to understand how they prefer to communicate, how they like to make decisions, even how they like to get recognized. You know, for one person, you know, having a big rah-rah, you know, making a spectacle of them to, is a reward. And for another person, it's their worst nightmare. So really trying to understand what makes them tick and how I can help them as a leader on their projects. And then the second aspect of that would be helping the team build trust between each other. One of the things I like to do, one of the little exercises I like to do is give them a set of questions that um, where they have to go and get paired off and interview each other. And then on a team call, I'll have them introduce each other on the call. So they have to get to know each other well enough to introduce the next person. And then they get to learn about each other. I like that exercise in a kickoff meeting that's face-to-face -to -face too. But it's one of those things that you could use face-to-face -face or in a virtual. Yeah. How does that work in different cultures? Did you ever get resistance there? In different cultures? No, actually, I haven't gotten resistance in different cultures. Um, I think that you have to be sensitive to how you structure the questions okay. on the interview so that, you know, if you do have a cultural situation where people, maybe people don't want to discuss intimate personal details, you don't put questions like that on the survey. You keep the questions more high level, like what's your favorite movie? Or, um, you know, how do you like to be communicated with in the team meeting? Do you prefer email, instant message, phone call? What's your first favorite mode of communication? Those kinds of questions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so you have to be always culturally sensitive okay. to that. Right. So now we've looked a little bit at what virtual teams are, what the problem is. We've delved a little bit into, into best practices already. Let's try to fix more. Let's try to look at this from a more global perspective. Um, you teach a seminar. You teach a seminar on leading virtual teams. And you talk about six key factors in uh, in your seminar. So let's take a look at all of them and see what a project manager can do. The first one that you mention is foster effective communication. So how do I do that? Well, it's really about active listening. As I said, you need to be a much more active listener. I mean, active listening is always a key thing. But in the virtual environment, you have to listen to what's not being said. Who's quiet on the call? I had a situation with one guy where 
he was really quiet on the call. And I, in talking to him after the meeting, I found out that, you know, he wasn't on board with my idea at all. And we actually had to go back and revisit it. And that really helped build the trust with him. The fact that I reached out to him to find out what was going on. Another thing I, I typically do is I validate assumptions. So I'll say, so what I hear you saying, saying Cornelius is, you know, whatever it is, mm -hmm. right? I really use that phrase a lot. And I don't assume that I know what, what a person is meaning by what they're saying, because we don't have any of those visual cues. The other thing that I think is really important to do, especially on an important decision or on, a, on a, a sensitive issue, is to actually go out and poll the team members on the call and ask them for their opinion or their view or their vote. So have them individually weigh in. And some people are just really quiet on a virtual call. And it's sometimes you'll have some people that are very bullish and they just talk, 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 talk. And the other people can't break in. So that kind of leads me to one of the other best practices as a leader is to make sure that everybody's getting equal time mm -hmm. on the call. So you really have to pay attention to who's talking and who's quiet and make sure everybody can break in. We do um, one, one thing that we do is we have instant message at work. So we'll assign one person as, you know, kind of the monitor in a big team meeting. And so if somebody's trying to break in and make a point and they can't get in there, they can instant message the other person and that person can, you know, say, hey, Joe, you know, Joe has a point to make. You know, let's let Joe in. It sounds to me like as a project manager on a virtual team, especially with the communications, you need a lot of your soft skills. Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, I really think it's it's 80% soft skills and 20% technology. Technology helps, but, you know, if you if you don't have the soft skills and the listening skills, then the technology is really not going to matter. Mm -hmm. There was one other thing I wanted to add that I think is really important about communication. Because you don't have that opportunity for kind of those water cooler chats yes. or, you know, say, Cornelius, you, 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 know, you did something in a, in a team meeting that upset me. I might come by your cubicle and just say, hey, can we go get coffee and talk about it? It's really important to deal with issues right away and really to think about how you're going to deal with them. It's really easy to hide behind email when you're in the virtual environment, but it's really not the best way to deal, especially with a sensitive issue or a sensitive situation. Use the phone. Find out how people want to be communicated with and, and use their preferred method of communication. Your second uh, key success factor here is focus on building relationships and trust. We've already looked at that a little bit. We've had the co-located kickoff meeting, right? Mm -hmm. yep. um, any other tools that you could mention in, in this area? I think it's just about helping to people to get to know each other. I'll give you a story. There was a person on one of my teams, and she was a really nice woman personally, and a very interesting person and involved with a lot of kind of interesting activities outside of work. And I got to know her very well. And sometimes on calls and meetings, she'd be fairly bullish and defensive, and it kind of put people off. But because I knew her, and I knew her well, I knew that her intentions were good, mm -hmm. so that I trusted that the, her intention was good, even though her delivery was a bit rocky at times. And I think that's really important. And the other thing about building trust with, in this particular situation was I could give her feedback and feel comfortable about that because we had built that trust up between each other. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really important. How about selecting your team? How does the selection of the team members play into being able to build trust? Interesting question, Cornelius. I mean, normally, I don't really select a team based on anything that has to do with a virtual team versus a co-located team. Mm -hmm. I mean, and in a lot of times, which is probably true with, with a lot of project managers, you don't have that much selection. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> You're given your team. Yeah, here they um, are. <laughs> Deal I mean, with of it. Of course, it would be great to select people that have a lot of experience being on a virtual team. But, you know, generally, that's not the case. I, I just haven't really found that to be a criterion selection at all. Right. Third key success factor, establish team identity and key processes. Now, why would I want to have a team identity for a virtual team? Well, if you think about it, when you're on a, a co-located team and, you know, you work in a building and, you know, people are talking about it, you know, maybe you've got some posters up, you know, you've got things going on that you feel really part of that team. But if you're on a team that's virtual and you might be the only person in your building in, you know, Switzerland working on this project and there's... 10 people sitting in San Jose, California, and a person in Texas and one in Paris, if you're kind of those outliers, it's kind of easy to lose touch 
with what the project's all about. And I think it is really important on any project to have an identity to really constantly reinforce the vision and the goals of the project with a team to keep them focused. But at Cisco, we often give teams names. Um, sometimes they're funky names and sometimes they're serious names. But a team name, you know, oh, you work on Cisco Knowledge Connection, Cornelius. Oh, I know about that project. Yes, I saw the webinar on that last week. That's really cool. So it really helps keeping people feeling from being isolated and makes them feel a part of it and stay focused. The other thing is if you're in a remote location, especially if you work, say you work for somebody who isn't the leader of this team, it's pretty easy to get pulled off into other work that's happening in your area. But if you have your identity and your focus knowing that, hey, I'm on the team that's going to totally change the way we do knowledge management in the group I work in, you're probably more likely to, to stay engaged in the team. Is it just a name or is it also a logo, posters, letterheads, signatures? Uh, so the, you the talked about thing? funding before, Cornelius. I mean, it really depends. <laughs> I've been on projects where we spent, you know, tens of thousands of dollars to make posters and we had a logo and, a, and we had a, t a tagline for the project and we actually had a contest to make the tagline yeah, yeah. for the project, um, you know, down to, you know, teams where we just basically came up with a name and, you know, we just sort of branded our emails with it and, you know, kind of went from there, maybe had some t-shirts made. So it just really depends on the nature of the team. How long is this project team going to be together? Is it like a two week project? You know, probably not so important, but if it's a one year project, it's probably important to have that. Okay. The next key success factor here, number four is conduct effective virtual meetings. We've already talked a little bit about the, 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 your bag of tricks that you have. My question for you now here is, if you have teams or team members rather that are in different time zones, you know, it's eight o'clock in the morning for me, but it's nine o'clock in the evening for the other person. Is there any way, any fair way of, of, of dividing this, this up? The real answer? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> but are there workable ways? So the, yes, there's workable ways. Every way that I've found has a plus and a minus to it. Yes. So somebody, you know, somebody's always kind of getting the short end of it. Yeah. Um, so one way is to, is to have multiple sessions. So I've been on, you know, several teams where it's a large team and we have a monthly, you know, team gathering and we do a, you know, an 8 a.m. session for Europe and the U.S. and we do a 5 p.m. session for the, you know, Western U.S., Asia Pacific and okay. split yeah, it up that, that way. Work. You know, one of the downfalls of that is you don't get the collaboration of East meeting West, mm -hmm. right? You get, you know, sort of the East talking and the West talking. Yep. So you have to do more work outside of the meeting to kind of pull that all together. The other thing you can do is you can rotate the time. So somebody's kind of out of luck every week on yeah. the meeting. And that works pretty well. But sometimes people forget, you know, the team time is moving. And, you know, sometimes people forget. And then sometimes the person who gets the middle of the night, you know, slot just doesn't come on that day because they just say, you know what, forget it. I'm tired. I've found that my rule of thumb is I don't schedule anything to start between midnight and 5 a.m. in anybody's time zone. Okay. Because you're really interrupting people's sleep. So like in my company, Europeans are used to working at night, you know, Asia Pac people are used to getting up in the morning and India is a really tough one because they're 12 and a half hours off from California. Yeah. That's just a really tough one. So they're, they're doing all sorts of weird hours and we're doing all sorts of weird hours when we're meeting with India. Yeah. Um, the other thing that, that we've done now, if it's a long-term project and you know, you've got people that are fairly dedicated to the project, we've had people work, um, San Jose hours. So for instance, oh, if, you know, 20 people on the team are in, are in California and there's, a, you know, five people over in Europe and they're dedicated pretty much 100%, they'll work one or two days in the, in the Pacific time zone. And we try to do all the meetings for the team on those two days. We try to get all the meetings in those days when, when it's normal for them. And then they just work, you know, midnight to 10. I, I'm sorry, noon to 10 at night. Yes. And uh, that works well. So lots of different ways to get around it. There is a there is some great websites out there that can help you pick a good time zone for a meeting for it to have a meeting in. Yeah. So if you Google on, you know, world time zones, mm -hmm. you'll come up with those websites. Yeah, I actually use them quite a bit lately. I have to schedule trainings for Japan and Hong Kong. And yeah. Yeah, I actually have a little um, a little tool that uh, the little freeware tool that runs on my PC where I can put up as many time zones as I want what the nice. time is. 
in the different places, and it's really helpful. Yeah, so that for I'm not you as a virtual someone. project manager, that must be a godsend. It almost. is. You're, it is. You always know what the other team member's time is. Yeah. You don't want to wake somebody up at four a.m. Yeah, not a good idea. Key success factor number five here is recognize and reward team members. By rewarding, do you mean physically giving them something? We're coming back to funding here again. <laughs> or do you mean just, you know, saying nice job, well done? Well, I th think in my experience, what goes, what goes the, the furthest way with people is really being recognized with their peers for their achievements. You know, the nice job, well done, but take it to the next level by letting their boss know formally recognizing them at uh, an organizational event, you know, getting them at Cisco, we have like teamwork awards and different things that are done at a fairly high level in the organization. So nominating people who have done a good job, really helping them to feel a part of the organization, because a lot of times if they're virtual, or like in my case, where I work at home, it really helps that recognition helps me feel like I'm a part of the organization. Uh, I have a thing I call significant smalls which is just occasionally reaching out and sending people, you know, maybe like a little Baskin Robbins $2 gift certificate and say, have an ice cream cone, you've done a great job on the team. Or just sending a personal card with a note in it to people and recognizing that, you know, how much I value their contributions to the team. So there's kind of the personal side of, of valuing the people as members of my team as a project manager. And then there's the part that helps them in their career, which is the recognition to, you know, their manager and, and other executives and other peers in the organization. Yeah. Does Baskin Robbins really sell ice cream for less than $2? <laughs> well, maybe I haven't done one of those in a while, Cornelius. I guess I'd have to move up to five on that one. I did do $5 uh, Starbucks ones last year for a whole team. And they really appreciated it. Yeah. And I sent, you know, a personal card with a handwritten letter in each one. I guess it's like bringing pizza to your team for lunch. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I mean, one time when we were launching, um, one time when we were launching a big thing, we had everybody, we, we sent everybody a bottle of uh, uh, champagne. Nice. And everybody got on a call and popped it at the same time. <laughs> so there's, you get creative. Get creative as a project manager and yes. really think of creative ways to, to reward and recognize people. Finally, number six here is enable collaboration and communication with technology. You started out with technology here. Is there a particular technological trend that you see? Well, I think that, you know, again, it's going to depend on your company policies and the funding and everything mm -hmm. else. Obviously, the most basic technology is the phone. Yeah. Um, and then when you can add some collaboration software on top of the phone, that 300% improvement in the effectiveness. Now, the next step that I'm seeing is really um, the application of Web 2.0 tools to this. So wikis, blogs. Um, one thing w that we're seeing now um, in my company that I think is a, it's going to be an interesting challenge for corporations is companies don't yet have the social networking tools within their enterprise that are available out on the public space. So things like MySpace and Facebook and uh, meet up. And there's lots of different tools that allow this many to many collaboration and sharing of information and photos and, you know, real time, real time instant messaging outside the firewall. Yes. But so, inside the firewall, it's yeah, a big no very no. scary. So the trend yeah. that I'm seeing in my company is to um, address that, you know, that opportunity inside the firewall. So what we're looking, one of the things we're looking at is taking our company directory and kind of putting it on steroids and making it like a MySpace site in order to help people do this many to many communication that, uh, you know, which really is the trend. That's where yes. Web 2.0 is taking us. Mm -hmm. So, so that's what I see. We're really just starting to use wikis and blogs. I mean, some teams use it more than others, but I wouldn't say that it's fully institutionalized at all. It's still fairly new, even within a progressive company like Cisco, but it's definitely the way that, that things are going to go. Interesting. So we have the six key success factors. The first one is foster effective communications. Then we've had focus on building relationships and trust. Then uh, establish team identity and key processes. Conduct effective virtual meetings recognize and reward team members, and finally, enable collaboration and communication with technology. Is one of these six more important than the others? Well, Cornelius, they're all important, because I think <laughs> you need all of them. But to be honest, if you don't build relationships and have trust, then I think you really set yourself to fail up in the virtual environment. You really need to, you really need to focus on that at first. You know, you can do virtual, you can do virtual teaming with a phone. But if people don't have any type of relationship or trust built up, it doesn't matter how sexy the tools are. 
It's so not going to happen. Would, would this also be a recommendation to a new project manager who comes to you and says, ah, oh, I've got this new virtual team. What do I do? Where do I start? I always tell people to start focusing on communication and having really clear roles and responsibilities in the team, really clear vision and goals, you know, things that you do on any good team, mm -hmm. but you just have to take it to a much higher level and consistently reinforce it and really think about it even more. And I guess while you can do this rather informally with a co-located team, with a virtual team, this has to be extremely formal. It has to be written down. It has to be communicated. It has to be repeated. Is yes. that right? Yes. I mean, consider on, you know, most teams do status reports or they do team meeting minutes. I mean, consider having your goals and vision on the top of every set of minutes that goes out. And, you know, I have to be a real stickler about minutes and, and, and documentation and storing key project documents in a place that everybody can get to, which isn't the hard drive of your PC, by the way. So whatever you've got at work, you know, whatever you've got to, to yes. enable that, I mean, it, that is really important because you just can't reach over the cube or look around the corner and say, hey, Cornelius, what, what did we decide at that meeting? It's really hard to do that. So things really need to have to be in writing and there just has to be this constant closed loop feedback. Do they get it? Do they understand it? Did I hear it right? You know, is everybody on the same page moving in the right direction? Let's take a look into a few issues that you've had on, on your projects, if you don't mind. Can you give us a, a couple of examples of things that didn't go as expected and how you resolved them? Yes. Um, fairly early on, I was doing a project. It was actually when I was a consulting project manager for my current company. And I made the assumption that a pretty critical area of the project was being handled by this team that was in uh, overseas. And I, you know, I, I thought because of a few conversations we had that everything was fine and it was, it was well underway. And I didn't follow up closely and I didn't ask enough questions. And when it came pretty close, we were about a week to way away from implementing and they're like, oh no, you know, we, oh, we actually God. haven't even started on that. We've Ouch. been working on these other things over there. So we called a really quick, uh, co very collaborative and uh, colorful meeting with the program imagine. manager to let him know what was going on. And, you know, and then we did get a, a plan together to rectify it. Mm -hmm. But that's one of the reasons I always stress the, you know, constant closed loop feedback, active listening, you know, following up with people on deliverables, making sure they're where they're supposed to be. Because I think if we'd been in the room together and we kind of had the schedule up on the board and we'd been, you know, doing what we normally do. Um, that probably wouldn't have fallen through the cracks so easily. And then I've had, you know, I've had more personal, you know, sort of soft skill issues where um, I had, you know, I had one guy that I was working with and again, you know, making those assumptions that he was on board. And I found out that um, I found out that he was actually really disappointed that he hadn't gotten this lead position that I had gotten. Oh, and I didn't, I didn't know that. And I didn't really talk to him. I was just really excited about getting the new role that I had gotten. And I, you know, started out pulling the team and, and running the team quickly. And through reaching out to him, you know, building some trust, he talked to me about, you know, his disappointment. And because he'd been a little resistant and a little, you know, kind of bullish on the calls. And what I ended up doing was I made him a co-lead. I was able to make him a co-lead on the project. And he was from Europe. And so we had a combined U.S.-European leadership of this particular track of the project. And it was extremely successful. Very nice. But because he was over in Europe and I didn't see him yeah. and I didn't hear the muttering and, you know, or see the hallway chats or, or see his face, I just assumed he was fully on board with being on my team. So that's a, that's a, couple, of, a couple of things that right. I've walked through. Now, in conclusion, where would you say the virtual teams are going uh, in the future? And what can we project managers do to get ready for this? Well, I, I, I know at my company, uh, as technology evolves and, we, and the Web 2.0 tools become more mature, um, we're looking at more and more virtual teaming to save on transportation costs. We spend a lot of money on travel. And so as technologies become more mature... We're being asked more and more not to travel to and to instead use the technology, which in fact at Cisco, it's the technology that we're pioneering for our customers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we're very big on eating our own dog food, as we say, and using our own technology. <laughs> so I think that, you know, there, from a budgetary standpoint, it's much more cost effective 
to do virtual teaming. Now the technology is catching up. It's becoming more practical to do virtual teaming. So as a project manager, I really encourage you guys to work on your soft skills, work on your communication skills, and start practicing really on that act of listening, um, increasing the amount of communication you do. Think about ensuring you've got clear roles and responsibilities you know, looking for common places to share documents, get all that done now because they're good practices, even if you're not on a a virtual team. It is coming. If it's not where you are now, it it most likely will be. So start getting ready now for that. Adrian, thank you very much for having been on the program. I enjoyed myself. Thanks, Cornelius. Thanks. I had a great time.